Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. On March 10th of this year, the world received news of a surprising new geopolitical alignment in the Middle East. Saudi Arabia and Iran decided to re-establish diplomatic ties in a deal brokered by China, ending seven years of estrangement between the two oil-producing giants. As Western powers have ceded influence in the Middle East and have focused their attention on the Russian-Ukraine war, a multipolar future is fast emerging as Asian economies and voices from the global south become more dominant. This Saudi-Iranian pact is also a vindication of the sort of foreign policy that India has been following, wherein a country's own interests are paramount and not dictated by any larger regional grouping. Come with us as we look deeper into the shifting world order, the geopolitics behind it and India's role in this fast-changing world. The writing was on the wall. After the hasty retreat made by the United States from Afghanistan in 2021, countries across the world acknowledged that a tectonic shift had taken place with respect to global alignment. This realignment had already begun after the COVID-induced supply chain shocks. The sloppy, hasty withdrawal of a superpower from a country that was vulnerable to fanatics and drug overlords confirmed a shifting global geopolitical order. Countries now needed to look into a future where multipolarity is the mantra and not siloed into groups that make little impact into the lives of their people. If uh, countries in Europe and the West and the United States are so concerned, why don't they allow Iranian oil to come into the market? Why don't they allow Venezuelan oil to come into the market? I mean, they've squeezed every other source of oil we have. And then say, okay, guys, you must not go into the market and guess the best deal for your people. I don't think that's a very fair approach. The new Saudi-Iran pact will mean less violence in the region. Iran will pledge to halt any attacks on Saudi Arabia. And in return, Saudi Arabia will reopen embassies in Iran. This is also a boon for Iran, as it reduces its international isolation and for greater peace in the Middle East region. It is critical to note that the Saudis went ahead with this deal, knowing that the United States and its allies have sanctions in place over Iran's civil nuclear program. Saudi Arabia has its own uh, considerations. Uh, its uh, relations with the U.S. have uh, come under some cloud, uh, come into a bit of controversy uh, due to a number of reasons. One is that the U.S. has stated earlier that it wants to redeploy some of its forces from the Middle East to the Indo-Pacific because of its uh, rivalry with China. Second is that uh, uh, there were some issues pertaining to the involvement of the Saudi uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman in the Khashoggi murder. So there were some statements by the earlier by people in the Biden administration which have not gone down well with him. Saudi Arabia's decision to follow its own independent foreign policy is similar to India's approach. India has close links with countries like Russia and Iran, both under sanctions from the West. Somewhere Europe has to grow out of the mindset that Europe's problems are the world's problems, but the world's problems are not Europe's problems. With the Russia-Ukraine war refusing to abate and the world lurching towards an economic contraction, it is critical for countries to have their own independent foreign policy that puts its people and pragmatic relationships with its neighbors first and foremost. The Saudi-Iran pact shows that the arc of influence of Western powers is not the same as it used to be. With the burgeoning growth of the global south, voices that were part of a supporting act in the past are now finding themselves in a leading role. Multipolar groupings like the Brazil, Russia, India, and China, or BRICS nations as they are popularly called, are as important as the quad grouping of India, Australia, Japan, and America. 
The one unifying thread in these groupings is the presence of India, evidence of a pragmatic foreign policy that is fast becoming a trend across the world. Moving on, people in Afghanistan never received what they anticipated prior to the Taliban return. While the security situation and the education have plunged to a point of no return, it is the unprecedented spike in the inflation rate following a severe shortage of essential commodities that have left the Afghans reeling and wondering what their future would be like. As the holy month of Ramadan set in, people said they were unable to meet their requirements. They accused the de facto Taliban government's mismanagement and its incapacity at getting themselves international legitimacy for the troubles they are facing at present. Have a look. Afghan markets are flooded with devout Muslims as the holy month of Ramadan has set in. This is the month when people buy everything from dry fruits to a variety of foods to mark the festival in the right spirit. While a part of Ramadan month is dedicated to expressing devotion to God through fasting, the other part comprises of both preparing for the fast by consuming an adequate calorie diet before sunrise to breaking the fast with healthy, scrumptious dishes in the evening. The month-long festivities also bring along expenses that often go beyond regular family budgets. For people in Afghanistan, the timing of the month of Ramadan couldn't have been more inappropriate. It has become nearly impossible for the people to manage expenses in these times when the unemployment and inflation is rife and there is little to no money to splurge. Locals complain that the commercial aspect of the festival has got the better of traders and businessmen who have been brazenly indifferent to the financial crisis and are selling even Ramadan essentials at exorbitant prices. On the other side, shopkeepers say that the economic crisis has hit them as severely as it has hit the common men and women. Shopkeepers say they themselves are disappointed as many people can't afford to have basic festival-related products. Many say the current situation in Afghanistan is the result of both the Taliban government's economic incompetence and its decision to reverse to the previous hardline Taliban era when a large section of the society was stripped of one or the other form of rights. The international community has been reluctant to recognize the Taliban 2.0, which has halted a large number of assistance missions reaching the common man. Women who are already bearing the brunt of Taliban's marginalization have been unfortunate even in this holy month, which is otherwise believed to bring health happiness and prosperity. Emirat Islami Amniyat khub az tamam chi bar qarar asak waqte ke kishwaray kharij jamoat nakun Afghanistan ba mi khatir iqtisad mardum Afghanistan zayif az. People are calling on the Taliban government to provide them with job opportunities and reopen schools for girls an issue that the international community is also insisting on. The Taliban, however, in its blatant disregard to human rights, especially towards women and children, have been bent on ruling the nation through its whims and fancies and not through protocols and policies. Moving on. Even after close to 15 years of adoption of a democratic model, Nepal hasn't completely matured into a democracy. Instead of governing the country for economic acceleration and prosperity for people, power tussles and infightings have ruled the discourse in 15 years of Nepalese democracy. Forging and breakup of alliances is a recurring phenomenon in Nepal. 
Experts opine it is high time when Nepal takes adequate measures to course correct its discourse and prevent both political and economic collapse, which the country is staring at. Nepal elected 78-year-old Ram Chandra Pado, a social democrat and a member of Nepali Congress, as its third president since the Himalayan nation ended a centuries-old monarchy. Pado was supported by Prime Minister Pushpa Kamal Dahal Prachanda against a candidate fielded by his key coalition partner, the Communist Unified Marxist-Leninist Party, UML. The presidential election has now created a rift within the ruling coalition, as the UML has withdrawn support for the Prime Minister, requiring him to prove majority in Parliament. Dahal's Community Party of Nepal Maoist Center, 4th Convention, is now expected to cobble together a new coalition with the Nepali Congress Party and other smaller groups. A new political crisis emerges as the Supreme Court will hear a petition demanding the arrest of Prime Minister Dahal, a former Maoist rebel chief who has been facing charges surrounding his rule during a decade-long civil war that killed thousands of people almost two decades back. In a country like Nepal, even the politicians are insecure uh, between themselves. You know, they don't trust each other. You know, and they, their first, their only intensive, in fact, is to be in power. You know, once they are out of power, you know, uh, they don't think that like anyone, no one wants to be an opposition party. You know, we just saw that. You know, because they want everyone wants to rule the country. Everyone wants to be in power. The 240-year-old monarchical rule in the Himalayan nation came to an end on May 28, 2008, when the newly elected Constituent Assembly declared Nepal a federal democratic republic. Unfortunately, the country has been struggling to uphold the democracy since then. Nepal is currently experiencing a triangular tug of war between the three major forces. A large majority of Nepalis will support the monarchical system. There are also the democratic forces, led by the Nepali Congress and the Maoists, those who fought against the monarchy. In addition to the three warring forces, different ethnic and cultural groups in the country have their own political interests. According to the Election Commission of Nepal, there are 192 registered political parties, including 11 national parties in the country. None of these parties or coalitions who have formed government have ever remained in power for the full five-year term. One of the sad reality of uh, Nepalese political party is our second generation leaders, they are not challenging to our older generation leader. I respect older generation leaders because they fought for the democracy, they fought for the republican country, they fought for the uh, federalism, but they couldn't institutionalize those uh, changes. Failing to provide any meaningful governments for Nepalese, the political parties in Nepal have lost the democratic values and ethics needed for the future of the Himalayan nation. Irrespective of their ideological differences, political parties in Nepal are engaged in forming coalition governments only out of greed for power. Such kind of opportunistic politics is continuously causing trouble for Nepal, especially for its people. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. U.S. and South Korean militaries conducted air drills as part of a joint field training exercise called Warrior Shield, the South Korean Air Force said this week. In video footage provided by South Korea's military, fighter jets including F-15Ks, F-35As and KF-16s were seen dropping various types of missiles and bombs which hit targets that exploded. South Korea's Air Force said the five days of air-to-air -air live firing and air-to-surface bombing drills started on Monday last week.
that is 20th of March with the US 51st fighter wing of 7th Air Force and involved various South Korean fighter jets along with the US A-10 attack aircraft to check precision strike capabilities of the Joint Air Force. On Friday last week, North Korea state media said the country had tested a new nuclear-capable underwater attack drone as leader Kim Jong-un warned South Korea and the US to stop their reckless anti-North Korea war drills. Thailand will hold elections on May 14th, the national poll body said last week, a day after parliament was dissolved. Early voting will take place on May 7th, while candidate registration, including for party nominees for prime minister, will take place in early April, said Election Commission Secretary General Savang Bon Mi at a news conference. The announcement comes as parties step up campaigning for a nationwide electoral contest that is shaping up to be a battle between a pro-military conservative grouping led by incumbent Prime Minister Prayuth Chan Ocha against the largest opposition Piu Thai party led by billionaire Shinawatra family. Piu Thai is expected to hold events daily across Thailand featuring the daughter of former Prime Minister Taksin Shinawatra. Pai Tong Tan, who has topped opinion polls as a potential candidate for Premier. <music> Japanese and Polish Prime Ministers said this week that bilateral relations between two countries are strong and will develop in different fields. Fumio Kishida, fresh from his visit to Kyiv, where he met with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, thank Polish Prime Minister for playing a major role in providing military and humanitarian help to Ukraine. Kishida's unexpected trip to Kyiv and Warsaw coincides with Chinese President Xi Jinping's state visit to Russia. Chinese President's visit to Moscow is very worrying. The China-Moscow axis is dangerous, said the Polish Prime Minister. Japan is due to host a G7 summit in Kishida's hometown of Hiroshima in May. Tokyo has continually voiced support for Ukraine and joined sanctions against Russia. A new U.S. Congressional Committee on China held its second hearing this week, highlighting what Washington says is an ongoing genocide against Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities in China's Xinjiang region. Rights groups accuse Beijing of abuses, including forced labor, mass surveillance, and having placed one million or more Uyghurs, a mainly Muslim ethnic group, in a network of internment camps in Xinjiang. China vigorously denies abuses in Xinjiang and says it established vocational training centers to curb terrorism, separatism, and religious radicalism. The hearing is the latest in a series of events planned for the next two years while Republicans control the House to convince Americans that they should care about competing with China and to selectively decouple the country's economies. Uyghurs say they are made to spend years in camps where they face abuse and forced patriotic education. The US government and parliaments in Britain, Canada and other countries have described China's birth prevention and mass detention policies in Xinjiang as genocide. A United Nations report last year said China may have committed crimes against humanity in the region. Moving on, Gudi Parva was celebrated with great pomp in Maharashtra. With lots of religious rituals and traditional customs, Gudi Parva is considered to be one of the most pious of the Hindu festivals, which marks the beginning of the new year in the most spiritual way. Celebrants gathered in Maharashtra's Nagpur to celebrate Guri Parva, a day that heralds the arrival of spring. Dressed in traditional Marathi attire, people sang and danced on folk ballads. Lajim, 
a form of dance performed by women enthralled the atmosphere with its rhythmic sound. Dhol Tasha, an inclusive cultural tradition was performed that electrified the surroundings and gave goosebumps to celebrants. बहुत अच्छे तरीके से कर रहे हैं सुबह से आए हैं और सुबह से एंजॉय कर रहे हैं और आगे भी करते रहेंगे और ऐसे ही सबने करना चाहिए लाइक एवरी इंडियन फेस्टिवल ईच एलिमेंट ऑफ गुड़ी पड़वा ऑल्सो हैज इट्स ओन स्पेशलिटी गुड़ी व्हिच इज मेड ऑफ बैंबू स्टिक्स ऑर्नामेंटेड विद अ पीस ऑफ कलर्ड सिल्क फैब्रिक इट इज देन कवर्ड विद अ गार्लैंड ऑफ फ्लावर्स दी कलश अ वेसल ऑफ सिल्वर और कॉपर इज कैप्ड ऑन इट Mythos say the festival of Guri Parva is associated with the day Lord Brahma created time and the universe. Some believe that the day commemorates the coronation of Rama in Ayodhya after his victory over Ravana. Chhatrapati Shivaji the great warrior of Maharashtra first started celebrating Guri Parva after his victory. according to our maharashtrian culture gudi padwa is the first day of our uh, calendar so we celebrate it as a new year so uh, while celebrating this we make it a point that we celebrate it in the morning with uh, our entire family as you can see our entire families we have we have uh, come here with our entire families with our elders with our kids so uh, it's a social function for us and uh, we really enjoy it Gudi Parva was celebrated with pomp in other parts of Maharashtra. A large procession was carried out with a big gudi. On this day deities are invoked for blessings. Gudi is raised to ward off evil and everyone enjoys the day. With India being primarily an agrarian society, celebrations and festivals are often associated with the change of seasons and the sowing and harvesting of crops. And Gudi Parva is one of them. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.